Hello from Jefferson Presbyterian Church. My name is Sylvia McDonald. If you watch our services on a regular basis, you know that our pastor is Reverend Paul Evans. Paul is unable to be here today because he is recuperating from surgery. I am joined today by Kathy Marquis, who is our videographer. We appreciate the many, many prayers that have been lifted up for Paul and for our church. We, we really want to give thanks to God for the love and care that, has, that God has, has really showered on Paul and on us and for God's unfailing presence with Paul and with us. During Paul's recuperation, we are fortunate to have ministers who have graciously volunteered to lead our worship services until such time as Paul is ready and able to resume his place in this pulpit. So for today and next Sunday, we are glad to welcome Reverend Rendy Trudeau as our guest minister. For our Jefferson Presbyterian Church members, a quick announcement to be watching your emails for details regarding a called congregational meeting via, to be held via Zoom. More information will be coming soon about that congregational meeting. As is customary here at Jefferson Presbyterian Church, we begin our time of worship with the passing of the peace. Even though we are not together physically, uh, we can still virtually pass the peace with one another. So family of faith, the peace of the Lord be with you and we respond and also with you. May what we do today bring honor and glory to our Lord Jesus Christ. grace of our Lord Jesus Christ to be with you. It is such a privilege to be able to be with you this morning in worship. I want you to know that the good folks at Covenant Presbyterian Church in Athens have you and Reverend Evans in our prayers. We pray especially for his healing. 
and for your comfort, your strength, and especially for courage in such a time as this. Please know that you are in our hearts, you are in our thoughts, and you are in our prayers as we come together now for worship. Let us hear the questions of the prophet Isaiah. Don't you know? Haven't you heard? God created all things and summons everyone by name. Don't you know? Haven't you heard? No one, nothing can compare to God's glory. Don't you know? Haven't you heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth, and never grows tired or weary. Don't you know? Haven't you heard? Those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength forever and ever. Amen. so loved the world that God gave the only Son, that whoever believes in him may not perish, but instead have eternal life. This morning, let us confess the ways we hide our eyes from that profound love. Let us pray. We've tried to hide from your searching gaze, O God. We've climbed mountains and burrowed deep into earth's caverns. We fled to the farthest edges of our souls and longed to sail in our fears to the dark side of the moon. And wherever we go, you are waiting for us. Even in the dimmest corners of our hearts, your light is able to find us. Lost, we are found. Afraid to speak of our sinfulness, you hear our stumbling words before we shape them in our minds. Unable to help ourselves, you redeem us through the gracious love of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. In silence, let us confess our attempts to live our lives out of God's line of sight. Hear the good news. In sorrow so deep we cannot find our way out, God cradles us in comfort. In moments so dark that we stumble over ourselves, God lights the way. In joy which cascades into our souls, God fills us with healing. Even when we cannot see it, God's hope is all around us, surrounding us with peace, with healing. Thanks be to God, we are forgiven. Amen.
as we come to this time of prayer, I invite you to keep in your hearts Reverend Evans and his wife Karen, as well as all your other loved ones who may be seeking some kind of healing, some kind of blessing. There will be a moment in the prayer when you may lift up those names to God's attention. Let us pray. Almighty God, as the days shorten and the leaves fall from the trees, we turn to you, our unfailing source of light and life. While we wonder what tomorrow will bring, we are certain of your love for us, no matter what challenges we face. We trust your promise to never abandon us and your power to uphold us all our days. We marvel that you choose to be in relationship with us, forgiving us repeatedly and surrounding us with grace daily. Confident in your never changing character of mercy and kindness, we turn to you now in prayer, laying bare our hopes, our fears, the longings of our hearts. Alpha and Omega, there is no corner of creation that does not belong to you, that is not beloved by you. We neglect our neighbors and ignore our siblings who cry out for help, but like a nursing mother, you cannot forget your children. Bring to our minds those for whom you would have us pray. As we remember the hurting and vulnerable you hold especially close, give us the courage to tend to them in ways that reflect your compassion and justice. Remind us yet again that when one part of the body hurts, we all suffer until that time we will all rejoice together. God of all that is seen and unseen, you give us your commandments that we might live in ways that reflect your will and to make abundant life for everyone. All of the law and the prophets is summed up in loving you with our hearts, our whole souls, minds, and strength, and our neighbors as ourselves. We ask, therefore, that our love of you and one another be tangible and transformative. Send your spirit to enable us to practice mutual forgiveness, radical hospitality, generous mercy, and relentless kindness. Help us to be gentle with one another, with the earth, with those desperate for relief and compassion. Loving Lord, we pause to rest in your presence, knowing that we are approved by you to be entrusted with the message of the gospel. We ask to be bold in our witness and humble in our service for the sake of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray together, our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Friends, there is a difference between planning and preparation. We can't plan the future that God holds, but we can prepare for each day by practices of generosity. Generosity helps us to forgive and to heal. It helps us to make peace in the world. It helps to bring justice and mercy to those in need. Our gifts this morning are one way we prepare for God's coming into the world in the most unexpected ways. Let us then gather our gifts together and offer them to God in gratitude and in praise.
one of the boldest prophetic voices of the last century, William Stringfellow, made this claim. He said that our lives are books of theology, stories about the way God works God's ways to be in relationship with us, works to bring about God's purposes for the world and for us in, with, and through us. The psalmist evidently knew that, for here's what he has to say in Psalm 139. Let us hear what the Spirit has to say to the church. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from far away. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, O Lord, you know it completely. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is so high that I cannot attain it. Where can I go from your spirit or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and settle at the farthest limits of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me and the light around me become night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is as bright as the day for darkness is as light to you. For it was you who formed my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works that I know very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes beheld my unformed substance. In your book, were written all the days that were formed for me when none of them as yet existed. How weighty to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. I try to count them. They are more than the sand. I come to the end. I am still with you. This is the word of God for all of the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Lord, your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. We need not stumble in darkness nor fear the night because you send your son to be the light of the world. In this hour of worship, we ask to be illumined by your wisdom and will through the power of your living word read and proclaimed. Amen. Do we get where we are by accident? Or is there some mysterious hand guiding us? That is the question spawned by a television series that aired some years ago on the History Channel. It was called 10 Days That Unexpectedly Changed America. Immediately, fans from around the world began posting blogs on the internet, reflecting on events that unexpectedly changed their lives. Some of these events seemed innocuous. For instance, in kindergarten, your best friend moved away. Some events seemed fortuitous. You happened to marry the woman of your dreams who just happened to be your boss's daughter. Some seemed downright lucky. You drew a number so high in the lottery that Uncle Sam did not call you to serve in Vietnam. Whatever the event, its importance was understood only in looking back. One blogger who had a hard time stopping at 10 events lamented, if only I had been blessed with the 2020 vision of hindsight as a teenager, my list would have been much shorter. Perhaps there is wisdom in coming up with such lists. I can't say for sure, but something about life our lives, especially now, or maybe just my life, I am willing to admit, 
and it's this. I should have written my list in pencil. Like the psalmist who wonders about his biography and God's book of life, I should have viewed the trajectory of my life as a mystery, an unknown. Like him, I should have planned lightly, hypothetically. I should have used words like maybe, possibly, perhaps. Instead, every chance I got, I wrote in stone and permanent marker. I stood on my future, on what I knew, on the certainty of what life would hold for me as though it was some kind of a rock. What I now know is something familiar to many of you, that instead of rock, the future is much more like a magic carpet, this wavy, undulating thing full of equal parts play and terror. The ground beneath our feet is lurching, breaking at a breakneck speed and making way for an entirely new thing every time we look down, surprised once again by a future we couldn't have predicted even six months ago. We are like the young girl Anne Frank, peering out our attic window at a kaleidoscopic world that one moment delights us and the next moment confuses us. Consider the trajectory of your own life, as Richard Rohr asks us to do in his book, Falling Upward. Is your path a straight, unbroken line? When I was in college, I was certain, in fact, beyond certain, that my best friend and I would go to law school in Washington, D.C. We spent our junior year as White House interns, and both of us were totally taken with the powerful people the majestic buildings, the cherry blossoms, and the belief that we were going to make a difference. It was magical. And I could see in my mind's eye very clear images of my lawyer self in my mid-twenties, living in the second story apartment, crammed with books in Georgetown, going to dinner parties where small talk is the stuff of gossip columns, dating strange but incredibly interesting men, many of them foreign, wearing outrageously expensive tailored suits, working hellacious hours, becoming the youngest in the firm to make partner. What I found though, is that I spent most of my first year of law school thinking about the junior high kids I worked with at church. Their games, recitals, retreats, their camps. So I transferred into a graduate school program and got married and once again, the future seemed crystal clear. It involved a hometown and a neighborhood with good schools, close, but not too close to parents. My husband and I went house hunting and bought a two bedroom brick home, two miles from our favorite Italian restaurant, near a big mall, anchored by a Toys R Us store, which at the time seemed like a true sign from above that we should stay we should sink some roots. Several years later, we moved to Roswell, which was not known for its Italian food or kid-friendly stores, but it was full of caring people who loved our babies and made our lives feel rich and full of wonderful things. After volunteering in churches for over a decade, I assumed I would continue in that vein for the length of my career as an urban planner. But that is not what happened. Little by little and without any intentionality, I found myself spending my free time doing church worky things as my grandchildren say. And the day to day of my life began to shock me with its depth, its goodness. To my deep surprise, I didn't find myself longing to return to the hectic way I lived for so many years. And now, as I close in on my retirement years after decades of ordained pastoral ministry and eyeball what Richard Rohr calls the second half of life, I wonder. I've spent most of my adult life carrying around this five-year plan in my head a plan that is continually and unexpectedly revised by this mysterious hand, so that now, 
In the throes of the season of the pandemic, when I think about the uncertain future, I have this to say. I'm going to scribble my remaining lists in a number two pencil, because when I listen to the psalmist, this is what I hear. That life with God at its core is about giving your life up, giving it up to something bigger, something more powerful. It's about saying at every turn that God knows better than we know and that God's spirit will lead us in ways that we couldn't have planned or predicted. You have searched me and known me, says the psalmist. And whenever we find the courage to trust the God who knew us while we were in our mother's womb, we find that there is a tentative feeling to the future, both a slight edge of anxiety, like anything can happen, and a slight bubble of hope and freedom that, well, anything will happen. Three years ago, I walked Stone Mountain with a friend who was an elder in her church. She and her husband have four children. He's a doctor in a successful practice, and they have this beautiful home where they entertain a lot. The last few years, they've been traveling all over the world serving as volunteer medical missionaries. Recently, they decided to move to North Africa with their children. As we talked about the move, the selling of their house and all of their possessions, I remarked that this period in her life must feel like some sort of an interim season. My friend stopped for a second, looked thoughtful, at me and said, you know, everything is interim. Every season I thought was stable and would be just how it was for a long time ended up being a preparation or a path to the next thing. When you decide to be on a journey with God, everything has to be interim. When I got back home, I wrote that phrase on a yellow post-it note and kept it on my computer screen. Everything is interim. Everything is a path or a preparation for the next thing. And we never really know what the next thing is. Life is like that, of course. Novel, surprising. But life with God is like that exponentially is what I'm learning during this season of the pandemic. We can dig in, we can make our plans, we can write in stone, we can pretend we're not listening. But the voice of God has a way of making itself heard. It seeps in like smoke or vapor, even when we've Katie barred the doors of our lives against any last minute changes to those five year plans. God's hand guides us to different countries, different emotional territories, different ways of living, different ways of being. God's hand keeps us moving, watching, never lets us drop down to a life set on cruise control or a life ruled by the remote control. Where, where can I go from your spirit? The psalmist cries, where can I flee from your presence? Think of life with God as a daring dream full of flashes and last minute exits and generally all the things we've said we'd never do in a million years. And with the surprises come great hope. When it comes right down to it, we've always lived our lives in the interim. We've always been in that middle space, the yearning and groaning, not yet heaven middle space that the Apostle Paul describes for suffering believers in Philippi. We may construct elaborate castles of business cards and L.L. Bean catalogs, hoping to beat back the sense that we are not enough. We may craft armor out of designer jeans and insurance policies and text messages, hoping to fend off the thought that life is not offering us enough. But the truth is that our lives are in interim especially now. And in those moments, when we're honest with ourselves, when we take the armor off, when we let those castles crumple, we feel the ache of living in that not yet heaven middle space. My youngest sister had one of those cars where you can plug in your destination. 
and a woman's voice will tell you where to turn and when to stop when you get there. When you got there, she would say in this totally dramatic, slow voice, you have arrived. I laughed the first time I heard it and begged my sister to plug in more places and then go to them just so this stranger could tell us again, you have arrived. That's what I want. That's what we all want. We want to arrive. We want to get where we're going and stay there. That's why so many of us are ferocious planners of our lives. And that's why we need to listen intently to the psalmist who tells us to keep moving, keep walking, keep taking teeny tiny steps, thinking about these things, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Because it's in those thoughts, those teeny tiny steps, that we become who we are, who God intends for us to be. We won't arrive. I'm not sure we ever arrive but we can become, we can stumble upon peace. And friends, isn't that a hopeful thing? Let us pray. Teeny tiny steps, oh God, teeny tiny steps are all we can take right now. But we trust that with each step, we grow closer to you, that we find the strength to keep on doing the things that we have learned and received and heard and seen in Jesus and the Apostle Paul, so that we may experience the peace of God that passes all human understanding in this interim season. Amen. better than you know yourself. No matter where you go, no matter what you do, 
God is already there, surrounding you with mercy, guiding you with love. So go out into the world with joy, with confidence, with peace, knowing that God goes with you this day and forevermore.